Hello, one and all, and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And in today's Kerbal Space Program video, we're going to be building something rather special. That's right, we're going to be building uh, my interpretation of a one-to-one -one recreation of the International Space Station. Uh, but with the twist, which I'm sure you probably have know because of the title and the thumbnail, uh, with the twist of it's going to be launched in one go. Obviously, the International Space Station is not a particularly aerodynamic shape. It doesn't really lend itself all that well to a being launched in one go. But we're going to have a crack at it anyway. And I'm going to try and make this as sort of to scale as possible. So I'm kind of having to use the Kerbal pieces, like the in-game parts, to set the scale for the crew modules, which you can see me placing here. We're currently constructing the Russian module of the space station. And then once we've kind of established this as our scale, we can then construct the stuff like, I don't know, the Canadarm 2, the truss structure, etc, etc. So that's what I'm doing this week. And uh, yes, you can see me building it here. Now, one thing I wanted to um, try and do as I built it in the space plane hangar, which is what you're seeing now, I realized that it's going to be a very, very long build process, the time lapse. I think the time lapse is like 10 minutes long or something. There is a timer at the bottom of the screen so you can kind of see when things happen so you kind of know what to expect. But I, I thought I'd try and make things a bit more interesting despite this by uh, building the parts in the space plane hangar when the part was added in real life. So I'm building this space station in the space plane hangar in the same way and same order that the actual International Space Station was built in real life. Now there are a couple of caveats to this. Right now what I've got here as it was when it was looked like this there was a big solar array above that little silver module just there but um yeah, I, that, I, that, was, that gets removed, so for the most part, I'm just saying, for the most part, this is pretty much how the International Space Station was constructed. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the individual components as I place them, just because uh, the footage is going by way too fast. I think I'm playing it like 12, ti 12 times faster than normal speed, and it's still uh, a very, very fast-paced video. To be honest, guys, I don't know yet if what, you're, what, I'm, what I'm watching now is going to be the final cut, because it might just be so fast-paced and too nauseating and too motion sickness-inducing to really show, so I'll have to try and slow the footage down and come up with some other creative way to make it not drag on too long, but I'm hoping it will work okay. Uh, so that's the main, <laughs> by the way, I've now done the main part of the space station for now. Now it's time to get working on the iconic truss structure that goes, that runs along the top of the space station. Now, visually, it's not a particularly accurate look. The actual real International Space Station does not have those cartoonishly large windows on any of the modules. Uh, I kind of wanted to strike a balance, really. I wanted this to be a fairly faithful recreation to the, you know, shape and design of the International Space Station, but I also wanted it to look like a Kerbal interpretation of it, and therefore use the actual Kerbal pieces, because that would not only add a little bit of Kerbal charm to the construction, but it would also add an actual functional interior to the space station as well. So that's kind of a, it's a little bit of a compromise. I think it's very hard to do a no compromises build of the International Space Station without using mods. And uh, I, I, I just like having the windows on the ship, quite frankly. Like when they're all lit up, it looks really, really nice. Sitting serenely in orbit. And um, and that's that. So that's kind of in case anyone had that question as to why am I not building this out of fairing pieces. Like most people build International Space Station replicas or any other Space Station replica, I guess. That's why. Whilst I'm going for a general shape, I also wanted it to be uh, Kerbalized. And that's why the actual gaps between the modules, uh, as in where they connect to each other, it's a bit of a bigger gap than it is in real life because, again, I'm using the in-game docking ports so that, you know, you could see how this thing could get built in air quotes now properly rather than this ridiculous way I'm building it. You may have noticed, the eagle-eyed among you may have caught a glimpse of the fact that this truss structure is actually attached to the main station via a rotation server. So, servo, sorry. So my idea was that I'm building the space station as it will be in orbit in the space plane hangar so I can get the scale right. But when it comes to actually launching this thing, this whole truss structure will be rotated to be in line with the actual main sta space station itself. So that it's a bit more kind of friendly in terms of launchability. That's uh, 
That's why I've got a rotation servo there. And, uh, and now we're working on the construction of the gigantic solar arrays. And look, there's another little feature I decided to add. These themselves are attached to a rotation servo because much like the uh, real International Space Station, I wanted the arms that, you know, hold the solar panels in place uh, to be able to rotate to make sure they're always facing the sun. Uh, that's how the real space station can, uh, you know, keep the solar panels pointing towards the sun. It's got these big rotating arms that the uh, solar arrays are attached to. And I kind of wanted that to have be some a functional thing on my recreation of the International Space Station. So that's another thing that I thought would add a nice little layer um, to this space station's build. Uh, now we're going to continue constructing some of the uh, components. Is this the Unity module? I'm like, uh, this is the. I know this is the ESA module. I don't want to start using my like vague knowledge of the International Space Station. Like, oh yes, here we are constructing this piece, and it's completely wrong. So what I'll probably do is put some annotation. Hopefully, I'll remember to put some annotations on screen showing you kind of what I'm building as it happens in the time lapse. Uh, and here we are adding a little thing. Is this called the Dexter? which is like a sort of robot that can sit at the end of the Canadarm2, allowing greater functionality. So my interpretation is just, instead of one docking claw, it has three docking claws, whoa, and also uh, two EVA seats so that a Kerbal can, you know, ride around with it. It just makes it a bit more fun. At the end of the day, this space station does not have any function. Like, it's pointless to build space stations of this proportion in Kerbal Space Program, but it's something that's fun to do. And since we're building it for fun, we may as well add some fun little features for the Kerbals to, uh, to experience. Now we're adding, I believe this is the Japanese lab module. <laughs> I'm sure I can put the proper name on screen. Uh, this is like the external experiment area with another little robot arm that can service those experiments. Uh, yeah. Anyway, some of you might be wondering, Matt, why are you building a single launch International Space Station on this particular week? And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that's because in a few days we'll be able to celebrate 20 continuous years of humans comprising 64 crews inhabiting the International Space Station station which begun on November the 2nd in the year 2000. I mean viewers of my Space This Week series will know about this already but uh, yeah we're approaching uh, the anniversary that marks 20 years of continuous human presence aboard the International Space Station which is a huge a huge deal if you ask me and you know the International Space Station's only got funding until 2024 so we may not have that many years left in the old beast so I thought now would be a good a time as any to present my ridiculous interpretation of the space station uh, for your eyeballs. But speaking of, you know, the space station and indeed its construction, it's pretty much done. There's not much left to add. We've got this little inflatable module just here, which is, is now over. That's how fast the footage is playing back. I am very anxious about how watchable this is going to be when I actually render it. I mean, in the preview window, it's running at like three frames per second. So it looks tolerable to my eye, but then once it's rendered we might find that it, the camera just moves way too fast to get any sort of meaningful idea of what's happening on the screen. But fingers crossed, it all works out fine. <laughs> anyway, now is the very tedious step of uh, folding everything up and getting it nice and ready for launch. I'm gonna just fade across because this actually took quite a while to do. All the solar panels and the pistons that they're attached to are now folded in as small as they can go. And uh, just before I rotate the truss structure into a better position, I thought it might be a good idea to have this little piece here fold away so that it doesn't get in the way. But I, I couldn't I couldn't sink it low enough. But then I thought, ah, uh, in KSP, parts can just clip through each other and it's not a big deal. It should all still work even though there is part clipping. So sorry, guys, you'll have to forgive my uh, very unrealistic use of part clipping in this otherwise flawlessly realistic spacecraft. I think the ridiculousness of this craft, it kind of permits a few little cheaty moments here and there. But now comes the difficult task of constructing some sort of rocket that can haul this leviathan into Kerbin orbit. And I decided to build this sort of scaffolding structure around the space station. These fuel tanks will give us loads and loads of places to strut the various station components to a more solid structure that'll hold it all in place. Now, it was very important that I didn't have any struts linking uh, two space station components together. Like, I couldn't strut the truss 
to the main station core itself because that would then stop the truss being able to rotate into its final position. So I had to make sure that if I was strutting the space station in place, which I needed to do for this thing to actually launch, I had to strut it to something that was going to get staged away, which is why I wanted the actual Ascension rocket to also serve as a structural scaffolding anchor point that we can uh, you know, strut all of the wobbly, flimsy space station pieces too. Uh, so that's kind of the upper stage there. We're just going to add a cluster of vector engines below it in just a second. The vectors were a great choice because A, they have quite high thrust and this is quite a heavy payload, but they've also got really, really, really high gimbal range, which will help us keep this very, very unbalanced payload under some level of control. Finally, for our lower stage, we're just going to go all of the boosters. We're adding a, a huge cluster of the Mastodon engines, which are of course are the um, the in-game analog for the massive Saturn V F1 engines. And oh, actually what I'm doing here as well, I can talk about this whilst it's on screen, I'm adding a little probe core to that lower stage just so that we can deorbit it because it's going to carry this thing all the way into a stable orbit, but obviously I don't want it to be left in orbit. So once it's separated from the space station, we need to have some means of it being able to steer itself away. And now we do, so it's fine. There were a few uh, mistakes and glitches and disasters during this process. So I'm going to leave that as ambiguous as it is to get that viewer attention up. And speaking of uh, things YouTubers have to do, guys, if you are enjoying this video, it really helps me out if you do leave a like. It helps favor me in the eyes of the algorithm TM. Uh, so I really do appreciate it. If you are liking this video, uh, a little like down below goes a long way. And uh, yeah, well, that sounded really insincere, did not it? <laughs> Let's move along to adding the crew. Oh, never mind. We've added the crew. Now we need to add more boosters because you can never have too many boosters. And we're going for very big boosters indeed. In fact, these parts before the Making History DLC came out were the biggest fuel tanks in the game. We have the Mammoth engines powering them, and Mammoth engine is, of course, the most powerful engine in the whole of Kerbal Space Program. However, it's not enough. I tested this vehicle, and it didn't have the control I needed it to. For some reason, it wasn't a very easy craft to fly. I'm not quite sure why or how this happened, but uh, yes, aerodynamics didn't really like this vehicle too much, so I actually ended up swapping out those mammoth engines for clusters of vector engines, just because the vectors have a higher gimbal range than the mammoth nozzles do, which just makes it a bit easier to keep this thing under control. We're also going to add some big uh, wing pieces to, again, just help facilitate controlling this vehicle. Once it's in flight, we've got these two big uh, Buran shuttle style fins on the actual side boosters. And then on the main stack, we're going to add four, um, four tail fins as well, I guess. And now it's only four vector engines on those side boosters. So it is effectively still the equivalent of a mammoth engine, but with much higher gimbal. But I think that's pretty much everything built. So we can cross fade across to the launch pad. Now, before we launch, it's probably a good idea to quickly take a look at how our Kerbals are doing. Oh my goodness, they're watching one of the many thousands of streamable documentaries from CuriosityStream, the incredible streaming service that has sponsored today's video. CuriosityStream has an immense library of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows that span a wide range of topics from history and nature to science and technology. Curiosity Stream has a plethora of award-winning exclusives and original shows and is available on a huge number of platforms, meaning you can stream their content to any device for viewing at any time, anywhere. Just use the code MATLOWN or simply click the link in the description to get 25% off and pay just $15 for an entire year. And with a massive library and 35 collections of curated programs handpicked by CuriosityStream's experts, that is an insanely good price. I've been a huge fan of CuriosityStream for a long time now, and I, and the crew here it seems, cannot recommend them enough. Give it a go for just $1.25 per month, this is the best value streaming service money can get. And while the crew watch their documentaries, here at Mission Control, we can just take over and initiate the launch. First things first, I'm going to slowly throttle up the engines because I find that just initiating full throttle straight away causes the whole thing to shake about a bit. So gently upping the throttle to max before hitting spacebar to separate those launch clamps. And off we go! To a blazing start. Okay, it's very slow. Let's just, we'll speed up the footage a bit for the sake of, you know, 
viewer enjoyment of the video but just bear with me guys it was a, it was a very very long launch i mean i'm trying to think back to uh how long it actually took to launch when i did it in in real in real life terms and i believe it took about half an hour to get from launch pad to stable kerbin orbit so uh i do it for you guys and i do it for curiosity stream curiositystream.com slash Malown link in the description. Anyway, the ad's over now. We don't need to talk about that anymore. Um, yes, as you can see, we are beginning our gravity turn. But some of you may be questioning, Matt, what are you doing? You're pitching the wrong way. And aha, that's because we're aiming to go for a polar orbit. Because I added one of those um, resource scanning things to the space station. Because I've never done that for Kerbin on Laon Aerospace before. And I thought it might be something worth doing for my aerospace company to have a good sense of what's actually in Kerbin so this space station will actually be serving a purpose. It's not going to be just some useless art piece orbiting the planet, no it's gonna serve as an actual really useful thing. I mean it's something I've considered doing for a while like I should probably do a polar orbit space station at some point so we can incorporate that scanning tech and why not do it in style. So and as such, the real reason for doing this space station makes manifest its ugly head. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's why I'm launching into a polar orbit as we, uh, we soar past the 20 kilometer mark nearly. I got a bit, I forgot how slow the footage was playing back, even at time lapse. There we go, 20 kilometers surpassed. Uh, I'm going for a slightly steeper gravity turn than I typically do because. I don't know if it's obvious to you guys, but despite my efforts of making the structural fuel tanks uh, a bit pointy at the end, this thing is still not particularly aerodynamic. So uh, we're going for a nice steep ascent profile so that we're not having to, you know, we don't, we, we, we minimize the risk. Great sentence there. We minimize the risk of flipping over lower in the atmosphere. And uh, that looks like that first stage there is burned out. Well, I say first first stage, but the first core of the first stage. Obviously, the side boosters decoupled long ago, but that's now gone. No one trying to say here, guys. It's getting late. What can I say? I'm pretty tired, getting a bit loopy, not eating anything all day. Oof. And, uh, and, and, and I'm doing a commentary. <laughs> okay, so now we're on that upper stage with the cluster of vectors. This is going to be what's going to get us all the way into Kerbin orbit and obviously it's going to decouple itself as well. Although, there was a bit of a problem with this. You may have noticed in the vehicle assembly building, can you see those front fuel tanks that make the point? Uh, the idea was that those are attached to hinges and just before I decouple the lower stage, I can flat, I can adjust the angle of those hinges so that those fuel tanks are in line with the rest of the fuel tank structure so when I decouple that lower stage they won't slam into the space station they'll angle themselves to be clear of it and separation will be you know all fine and dandy and nominal however I stupidly put struts joining those four fuel tanks at the front together which means that those hinges are useless because the struts will just hold them in place oops my bad so we're going to have to uh, get creative when it comes to decoupling this lower stage. And by creative, I mean exploit a glitch in Kerbal Space Program. I mean, it technically, technically it's doable without using glitches because, uh, as you can see, the space station can move laterally out of this frame here, no problem. But I didn't want to risk, you know, having things accidentally boop each other because it's a fairly fragile structure. And I say that, and I'm well aware I'm saying this as we're blasting it through the atmosphere at 1700 meters per second. But just bear with me here, I was still a little bit nervous about actual physical things hitting it rather than just heating effects. So when I say the glitch, all I'm going to do, because I think it happens fairly quick <laughs> with the footage playback at this speed, I'm just going to decouple that lower stage and then activate uh, non-physics time warp, so I guess just normal time warp, and then collision physics stops being a thing and we're going to just allow the two craft to separate through each other. Uh, it doesn't matter because it's time warp. And that's, that's the glitch I'm talking about. Well, it's really hard to continue talking about relative, relevant things because we're still ascending. This is a very slow ascent. I did consider speeding the footage up a little bit faster than the speed it's currently playing at. But at the moment, it's playing back four times faster than regular speed. And four times speed, as in like post-production time lapse, is the maximum speed that Sony Vegas can uh, speed footage up without distorting the audio. Well, I guess distorting the audio is the wrong word. Without desyncing the audio. Like, it can't speed up the audio 
any faster than four times speed. So if we were to speed up the video faster than four times, the audio would be all out of sync. Which, you know, it's not a huge issue. We could just mute the footage or just, you know, try and come up with a... I could just make the sounds with my mouth like I did with that with that one KSP tutorial. That did really well, actually, because maybe that's something I... Maybe I, did I learn something just now? I don't know. Anyway, uh, it probably would have been that detrimental, but I think it really adds something when there is the relevant in-game sounds happening with the footage. So that's kind of why I went with a four times regular speed. And I don't know. I think it's quite therapeutic to watch a ship that is vast in size that would normally make KSP's frame rate tank to, uh, you know, single digits uh, fly really, really well with a really fast frame rate because obviously it's been sped up. I think there's something quite cool about that. And, uh, you know, it's cool kind of seeing the whole thing happen at not real time speed because, again, I'm not going to subject you guys to a, a half an hour video of, I don't know, 10 FPS gameplay of getting this Leviathan into orbit. And, um, you know, on the subject of that, we've nearly got this Leviathan into orbit. We have now passed the Kerman line. <laughs> and uh, we are now in space. Of course, we are still on a suborbital trajectory. So we need to perform a prograde burn at Apoapsis to get ourselves st stabilized. And uh, was as in like in a stable orbit. And then we can decouple that lower stage and then get ready to... Uh, deorbit that lower stage, but there were some issues, and not just the issue that I raised that the actual scaffold structure can't unfold itself like I originally intended it to do. Uh, the Kraken did rear its ugly head, and you'll see. It was quite funny, actually. So you'll see in just a second in what way it did that. But I think we've just circularized. Now it's time to uh, decouple that lower stage. So we're going to decouple it. And then we're going to quickly initiate time warp. So again, not physics time warp, just regular time warp. And as you can see, the two craft separate beautifully. And that's all that. <laughs> so I did. It turned out I did actually have time to talk about the glitch as it happened, as in like the glitch I was exploiting as it happened. But I don't know. I, I decided to mention it earlier as well, just because I, I don't know. It, my mind, it's just it can wander, and I didn't know if I'd be on some random tangent about something. Oh, there's a, I probably should have <laughs> quickly cancelled out the movement using time warp. Oh, get Kraken's, get Kraken's enjoying himself. Can we overcome it? I can't remember if I did succumb to a Kraken attack. But yeah, I probably should have slowed down the uh, rotation speed of that rotation servo that the, uh, the truss structure is attached to. Maybe it's the damping that we're seeing now rather than actually the Kraken freaking out. So I was kind of just intermittently dropping in and out of time warp to kind of calm the ship down a little bit and then once we kind of sufficiently reduced the wobbliness we can extend those solar array arms and then once that's done which uh hasn't actually happened properly because i think i forgot to uh bind a few of those pistons to the action group that deploys these arms so we're going to quickly find the culprits and extend them up to the length that i need them to be extended to and then we can hit the action group that deploys the solar panels themselves and there we have it. Wow, come on. Didn't everything just... Oh, <laughs> I just moved the camera around and saw in the distance. Uh, wacky waving, arm flailing tube man having fun there. So, yes, uh, I, it, the Kraken enjoyed... I think the Kraken stopped playing with the space station when it realized that this thing looked a lot more fun. So I'm going to quickly... I quickly reloaded a quick save uh, and then started deorbiting this thing before the Kraken had a chance to start ripping it apart. And as we can commenced our deorbit burn. It started going a bit hairy, but watch that periapsis thing on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. You can see that it didn't matter because just before it ripped itself to pieces, our periapsis was suborbital. So I think it was, I mean, it, I don't know if the cracker might have flung stuff out of the orbit again, but I think it was all fine. So now we can just uh, inflate that experimental inflatable module there. And, uh, that's it. That's actually, that's the space station done. So, uh, yeah, I guess we can get one of the Kerbals into the airlock just there. So we can go on a little EVA and survey the uh, the structure that we've got in. Wow, it really puts into perspective the actual scale of this thing. Oh, we've got that. I deployed that antenna there as well. So we can actually do some resource scanning. And as you can see, you can sort of see the UI on Kerbin down below, those pink bands there. Don't worry about them. There's not a visual glitch. It's just part of that scanning module. And there is the space station. And like I say, I know it's not completely realistic. Like, we've got those gigantic windows. Like, it looks very, very Kerbally. But that was kind of the, the point I was going for. And now we can put him on that little seat on the Dexter module and uh, play around with the Canada Arm 2 and uh, carefully maneuver him to... Um, 
to somewhere. Oh! <laughs> yes, I, I really should have probably slowed down the traverse rate of these robotic parts. But hey, I'm sure our little Kerbal there is having lots of fun being flung around uh, precariously against the space station. So I'm trying to maneuver him to the Japanese module. Just that, whoop, flailing a bit, uh, but it's okay. Can we now steer him around? Maybe we should go for the Columbus module instead, the, e the ESA module, that one on the... Kind of lower left, all that's out of view now. There we are. Now, one thing that's not realistic here, the thing the Canadarm 2 is attached to is like a... That thing can actually move along the truss structure. I couldn't really find an elegant way to do this in KSP, oh my goodness. Oh, and now he's glitching through the Japanese module. What was that? What would that look like on the inside? He's like a phantom, just <laughs> drifting in and out of the walls. Oh, there we are. Is the real International Space Station haunted? It is. It might look something like that. That's what I'm recreating here, guys. And uh, I think that's a good enough demonstration of the cannon arm 2 there. Uh, it, it, the Kerbin arm 2, if you will. It worked pretty well. And there we are. I mean, there's not much more to say, really. I'm really happy with how the space station turned out. In fact, there is stuff I need to say because I bound those motors. Well, actually, that's what I'm doing here. I decided to bind the solar array motors to uh, J and L, which is translate left and right on the action group menu so that we can actually rotate them to face the sun and again I didn't I probably should have slowed down the rotation speed of those motors so I quickly dropped them down to the absolute lowest possible value they could be uh, quickly again just stabilize the craft by dropping it in and out of time warp time warp in quick succession to dampen the movements and uh, then we could just you know play it at a normal speed. I will speed the footage up so it's not quite so boring to watch, but that means that the actual physics don't freak out and the ship stays, you know, more or less stable. So there we are, a little demonstration of how the solar arrays can turn much like the ones on the International Space Station so that we can always make sure they're facing the sun. I think the space station's actually facing the wrong way, really, so it's not its not a great demonstration of it actually working properly, but it's a demonstration, at least, that this thing can move like the real space station, albeit in slightly wobbly fashion, but, you know, it's a Kerbal Space Program replica. There's always going to be a little bit of a compromise. But that pretty much wraps up the core subject of this video, and that is launching this thing in one launch, getting into orbit and unfolding it. So, guys, I'm just going to leave it there, I think, but if you do want to check out Curiosity Stream, and I highly recommend you do, I, I cannot endorse <laughs> Curiosity Stream enough. Uh, they have great, 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 great content there. There is a link in the description to pay just 15 quid a year. That's, that's, that's insane value really and uh, you can use the code Matt Lown or one word as well to get the 15% off anyway I'm gonna leave it there for real easy this time there's some things on screen isn't it on screen you know they work by now it's YouTube innit uh, I'll see you next time it's probably on Monday in space this week what a great sign off see you bye